sometimes the dialogue in a therapy and coaching session takes us in a different direction. That's important. Actually, it's critical because it means that we are expanding in whatever wisdom, guidance, help, and reprieve one can receive. And it means that you are being stretched beyond your comfort zone to places that you need to go, you need to learn about and grow. Emotional intelligence was developed as a psychological theory in an article written in 1990 by Peter Salovey and John Mayer, which they defined as the ability to perceive emotions, to access and generate emotions so as to assist thought, to understand emotions and emotional knowledge, and to reflectively regulate emotions so as to promote emotional and intellectual growth. Daniel Goleman, a science reporter at the New York Times, read the article written by Salovey and Mayer, which offered a new way of thinking about our emotions. Goleman went on to study and write about what we now call EI, or emotional intelligence. In 1995, and in his groundbreaking book on the topic, Daniel Goleman reported on the psychology and neuroscience the study of emotions and the brain, to explain how we are affected by both our rational and emotional mind, and how they together shape our destiny. I'm going to share a little later Goldman's concept of the five crucial skills of emotional intelligence, and how each determines our success in relationships, work, and even our physical well-being. What emerges from this research today continues to be an entirely different way to talk about being smart and how emotional intelligence fuels our ability to be empathetic, a skill that we all need to live now more than ever. Hello, this is Dorothy. In addition to the weekly format of this podcast in which I offer practical and spiritual wisdom that I lovingly share with you each Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am so excited to offer a second format of amazing content. It's called Ask Dorothy. These episodes reveal the inner workings of what really happens inside a session of therapy and life coaching with me. Here I dive into the richness of content that each client brings to our sessions and how we best navigate what insights, teachings, solutions, and of course, healing and wholeness abounds. I know that listening will offer you much wisdom and guidance in the ways that bring to life what you need and also how to implement the best practices and teachings that I share to honor all of what you seek and all of what you are becoming. In each of the Ask Dorothy episodes, you will also hear my candid observations and commentary and the process for how we arrive in a place of harmony, relief, clarity, understanding, and the true change that happens in each and every session because of a client's willingness to grow, to evolve, to move beyond their comfort zone and into the revelation of what they already know, what they learn to be capable of, and what they desire most for their life. My job is always to support a client's progress and to provide the right tools and best therapeutic practices to ensure that each client will reach their goals, including to be all that they wish to become. I hope you'll enjoy the Ask Dorothy series as an opportunity to have the knowledge and insight of what we can do together. If you have a question that needs my love and helpful guidance, please write to me. All right, so let's jump into this episode and ask Dorothy. In this three-part Ask Dorothy series on emotional intelligence, I share three very different client stories 
each of which highlights what so many of us continue to struggle with, a lack of emotional connection, loneliness, and separation from self that can spiral out into other mental health challenges, such as a lack of motivation, withdrawal and isolation, depression, suicidal thoughts, and reckless and risk-taking behavior, including abuse of drugs and alcohol. In this first episode of this series, dedicated to learning the skills of emotional intelligence, I share a quote from my client, Anastasia. But first, here is some background. Anastasia is a mother of two twin toddlers ages one and a half and a four-year-old. And Anastasia was recently arrested when her husband of six years called the police. The two were quarreling at 1 a.m. as one of the twins had woken and her husband Aaron was having a difficult time helping the child to fall back asleep. Anastasia heard her daughter awake from the other room where her four-year-old son had only just fallen asleep next to her in his bed. Life at this stage was challenging for the couple three children under the age of five, both parents working full-time outside the home, sleep-deprived, and with their own relationship issues that had significantly digressed over the last several years. They were in some way strangers, existing in support of their young family, but with little attention and a lack of time to care for their own needs. Anyone who has young children understands the stresses of simple things. For example, bedtime rituals that last for hours, a lack of quiet long enough in which to hear your own thoughts, to remember that you are a separate being that has needs, and the chronic sleep deprivation that you learn to adapt to, even though it's painfully difficult. On that night, everything changed. Anastasia bolted into her daughter's bedroom, was diminishing in her words, and even pushed her husband aside to retrieve her child. Aaron was sick with a cold and running on little patience as he desperately wanted his daughter to return to sleep so that he could return to his place on the couch downstairs. More unpleasant words exchanged, and then, somewhere amidst the chaos and the crying, fully awake child, Aaron retreated to the master bedroom. Anastasia in pursuit. She was not going to let go of her anger. Aaron retreated further, now into the master bathroom. Their son, also now awake because of their raised voices, was at Anastasia's side, begging his mom to stop yelling at his dad. How do we become so unaware of our emotions and how they fuel what actions follow? Two months later, and in my sessions with Anastasia, we discuss the topic of emotional intelligence. She was arrested on that night. Aaron called the police and explained that he did not feel safe. As Anastasia described to me, we both were not trusting of the other. Maybe Aaron felt that to call police would be a preemptive strategy and a way to highlight the problems and simultaneously receive help. These fights were not infrequent. When the police arrived, they arrested Anastasia. She had to relinquish her house key and is currently living with her parents. The twins are with her and her son is continuing to live with his father in the family home. The kids are reunited on weekends, alternating between their home with their father and being at their grandparents with their mother. Anastasia continues to work with me and is hopeful that her lawyer will be able to resolve the matter. The courts will look favorable to the fact that she has received counseling and is making notable changes to how she views her life right now, in finding and feeling appreciation for Aaron rather than anger, and realizing how she was the catalyst how her emotions triggered a difficult sea of events that she needs to be accountable to. 
In Anastasia's words, I am doing okay. It's a lot to process. Identifying and changing some deeply ingrained thought patterns that I was not mindful of before has been especially challenging. I am glad you have turned me towards these things so I can face them. No deflection and full accountability. I am also very good at avoiding vulnerability. So good that my emotional knowledge and even vocabulary are limited. It makes it hard to express myself. I've been doing some reading to expand on these areas and looking for some simple daily habits to cultivate my emotional intelligence, which obviously needs work. And all of this because I want to be able to state my needs clearly and understand my husband so that we both feel loved in a way that we need. I feel like we were in two different chapters of the same book, never mind on different pages. And that is something that I want to change. I don't want to be that person anymore. Let's now have a look at the list of the five basic competencies of emotional intelligence and the ways in which you can build and strengthen your emotional intelligence and why you will want to. The list of five are self-awareness, self-regulation, inner motivation, empathy, and social skills. Let's dive in. First, self-awareness. If you are self-aware, you always know how you feel, and you can recognize your emotions and your actions and how they affect yourself and others. To be aware of your feelings is the first step to changing them. To have a high level of emotional intelligence is to choose how you want to feel and then to change your thoughts accordingly to what you need to think in order to feel the way you want to feel. This is an incredible life skill and it is how you possess higher levels of EI. It is also a skill I teach to clients. To improve self-awareness, you can practice identifying your feelings, particularly when how you feel is less than ideal. Just naming your feelings is helpful to understand why you feel the way you do. Labeling your feelings lends itself to understanding your current mood state and what thoughts and perceptions have lent itself to what you feel. When I teach the principles of cognitive therapy, it becomes even more relevant how your thoughts determine how you feel. The next step is to change how you feel by first changing your thoughts. You can also keep a journal to note the feelings you identify in any particular moment. This is also helpful to do after a meditation practice when your mind is more likely to be calm and when you are aware and attuned to your inner world. Journal writing helps you improve self-awareness. Even a few minutes each day, writing your thoughts will move you to a higher degree of self-awareness and thus emotional intelligence. Finally, you can develop greater self-awareness through the practice of slowing down, of being present to your experiences, and doing one thing at a time rather than multitasking. Anastasia decided that she would pause in moments when she felt her negative emotions building. Pausing from speaking entirely gave her an opportunity to assess the situation from a different perspective, and it was helpful to refrain from saying something, whether to Aaron or the children, that would create more tension and frustration or hurt feelings. When you experience anger or any other strong emotion, slow yourself down and examine why. Remember, regardless of the situation, you can always choose how you will think feel, and react in those moments. 
The second competency of emotional intelligence is self-regulation. This is a popular topic when I work with clients. So when you practice self-regulation, it means that you have been able to identify your emotions using self-awareness and to notice when your emotions are becoming elevated or intensified, to which you then calm yourself. You regulate down or up as needed. Sometimes we need to pick up the pace and activate positive emotions by energizing ourselves physically and by thinking and visualizing positively. Most times, though, self-regulation is needed to calm and soothe ourself. You can self-regulate to calm and alleviate stressful situations most easily through deep breathing which initiates the vagus nerve to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, to which you will then experience a relaxation effect. I'll leave some techniques for this and helpful resources in the description. Here are two effective ways to learn and practice self-regulation. First, for Anastasia and for each one of us, self-regulation is achieved by being accountable and self-responsible. So if you tend to blame others when something goes wrong, stop. Instead, admit to your mistakes and face the consequences, whatever they are. This is how you build emotional intelligence, and it is how you live authentic and true to yourself. When you look to yourself first for addressing a problem, you discover and grow and you become more self-aware and responsible to all of your decisions, knowing that your choices always impact the outcome. Others will respect that you are accountable and that you take responsibility for yourself and of the situation. You can also practice self-regulation by being calm. In any challenging situation, be very aware of how you act and react. For example, how do you relieve stress? Do you raise your voice? Do you vent to others? Do you blame others? You can practice being calm, even in stressful situations, using deep breathing and through being present and self-aware, and by focusing on the outcome that you want. Often, it is more helpful to listen first and then give yourself even more time than you think you may need before responding. Anastasia and I decided that she would pause first, that was her word, to listen to Aaron or her children, and then to give herself additional time when needed by speaking to this. For example, excusing herself to think about how she wanted to approach a conflict with Aaron would be far more helpful than to jump in aggressively. You can also write your thoughts and feelings, especially in a conflict situation, whether with loved ones or work colleagues, as a helpful way to process your emotions and the experience you've just had. When you come back to what you've written a little later, and then again the next day, you will have a different perspective from which to approach what you want to say and how you will want to address and resolve the issue. The key is to take as much time as you need Rushing to fix a problem is not always the best answer. The third basic competency of emotional intelligence is internal motivation. To be driven by money and material rewards is not a beneficial characteristic if you want to develop EI. Having a passion for what you do is far better for raising your level of emotional intelligence. Having a passion and a purpose leads to sustained inner motivation, clear decision-making, and a greater sense of meaning and fulfillment in your life. Self-motivated leaders work consistently towards their goals, and they have extremely high standards for the quality of their work. How can you improve your motivation? Well, here are three best practices. First, Re-examine why you're doing your job. At times, it's easy to forget 
what you really love about your career. So take some time to remember why you started this job and what you enjoy most. If you're unhappy in your role and you're struggling to remember why you chose it, ask yourself why. Starting at the root often helps you look at your situation in a new way. And you can also reassess your goal statements and what makes your job important to you. A second way to improve internal motivation is to have an interest in learning and self-improvement. This is about having the strength to keep going when there are obstacles in life. It's about setting goals that inspire you and following through with them. Someone with good emotional intelligence would have initiative and the commitment to complete a task and the perseverance in the face of adversity. For example, if you fail a class or a test or even a course, you see this as an opportunity to learn and retake the class or the course without self-doubt. You don't let failure get in the way of your goals. Internal motivation-driven goals are far more important. They are such goals as earning a college or university degree or becoming a healthier person. These are accomplishments that are driven by your desire for self-improvement, rather than goals that flaunt wealth or status. And a third way to improve your internal motivation, be optimistic. Whenever you face a challenge or even a failure, find at least one good thing that you've learned or that's come out of that situation. I often pose this as finding the silver lining. It might be something small, although usually the good offers you long-term effects, such as learning an important life lesson or becoming more emotionally resilient. I would say there's always something positive to find that inspires and motivates you if you look for it. The fourth basic competency of emotional intelligence is empathy. Empathy is the action of understanding, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and the experience of another, of either the past or present, without needing the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. How can you improve your empathy? Well, here are three of the best ways. First, put yourself in someone else's position. It's easy to support your own point of view, yet if you practice looking at situations from another person's perspective, if you really make an effort to understand what they are describing and their experiences, this is empathy. Second, pay attention to your body language. Your body language tells others how you truly think and feel about a situation and what they are conveying. It's how we learn to relate to one another beyond our words. Be open and engaging with someone and make eye contact. Let them know that you are listening, that you are present to what they are saying, and that what they convey is important. And third, respond to other people's feelings and their expectations. You can show that you care and that you have empathy by acknowledging someone's feelings and their life situation. You can express your appreciation. You can be supportive and you can show how you are excited for someone's positive situation and all of the good that they have in their life. Empathy isn't only reserved for when someone is explaining or expressing a difficult time. It's about showing them how happy and excited you genuinely are for them in the good times. And finally, the fifth basic competency of emotional intelligence, social skills. Someone who has good emotional intelligence is also a good communicator. They are just as open to hearing what someone has to say and are also good at managing change and resolving conflicts diplomatically. You can build social skills in your quest for having high emotional intelligence in three ways. 
first in your ability to connect with others, to find common ground, to make friends with people easily, and also to maintain the friendships and relationships that you currently have. Second, having emotional intelligence is having good communication skills good time management, the ability to lead and manage people, and also to resolve difficult situations or conflicts. To improve your social skills, it's important to learn conflict resolution skills. To be able to resolve difficult situations or conflicts in a fair manner. And third, social skills involve learning how to praise others. Praising others is how people feel good, how they feel good about you, how they feel good about their own life and their own situation, and it definitely builds rapport and connection. Improving each of these five competencies of emotional intelligence will enhance the quality of your relationships and allow for a deeper understanding and connection with others, provided that they too have good emotional intelligence. Having high-principled EI will make you more attuned and aware with all of life. Emotional intelligence is something that you can up-level to be more resilient in times of stress and hardship, to practice more of what you love by choice, and to have greater clarity of a situation and of what you need to do and to be able to better identify and express your true thoughts and feelings. If you would like my help with any of these competencies of emotional intelligence, please reach out to me. Let me help you. And I invite you to join me for part two and part three in this series of Ask Dorothy on emotional intelligence. We're going to dive in even deeper. And in the meantime, I'd love to hear from you how these five basic competencies have helped you improve and live a higher level of emotional intelligence. Thank you so much for listening. Sending you great love. This is Dorothy. Namaste. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of the Wisdom Podcast. To hear more, please check out the other episodes right here. And I'd love for you to subscribe and share your feedback on this or any episode with me. And then join me at DorothyRatusny.com, where you'll find the wisdom blog, the inspiration for this podcast, the latest online courses that I teach, my YouTube videos, and the wisdom archives, which are an extensive library of guided meditations, mindfulness musings, spiritual teachings, and best therapeutic practices for your whole being, and to nourish and heal your life, plus many other special offerings of love. Please also visit me on social media and say hello. Allow yourself to go within, to access your inner wisdom, and to live this. Awaken your authentic power Live your truth and be love. Thank you. This is Dorothy.